Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Quincy at St. Peter's School with Reverend Augustine Tolton, the first African-American priest in the United States. What makes him so special, you might say? Well, he was born to a slave family which escaped and came to Illinois. He was not wanted in the priesthood, but he stuck with it. And recently, the Catholic Church has begun proceedings looking into his possible sainthood. Here's the story. Okay, we're very fortunate to have the museum, the Gardner Museum of Architecture, to, uh, to bring this Father Tolton story to the audience. Matt Morris, you have done a considerable amount of work looking into the life of Father Tolton and actually developed a program as Father Tolton's mother, uh, who was a very brave woman, apparently, because she was trying to raise a family in the slaveholding state of Missouri and came to the conclusion that, that she was not going to be able to do that. Um, so first let me ask you though personally, what made you attracted to the Tolton story and got you to want to develop this program? Well, I think it was the strength that Martha had and um, Martha reminded me of my grandmother who had 13 children and had to take care of them herself mm -hmm. in Mississippi during the Jim Crow days mm -hmm. and um, I, I just I was drawn to her strength and, and her willingness to do whatever it took to take care of her family. Mm -hmm. Just for a little background now, your, your, uh, your husband, Ms. Mrs. Tolton's husband, joined the Union forces. He did. He, so in, a, in essence, deserted the family to join the Army. Well, they never felt deserted because they always felt this, the presence of his spirit there because of the reasons that he left. He left because he wanted freedom for the family and mm -hmm. also he wanted the children to be educated, which was not possible in the state of Missouri because slaves were not allowed to be educated. Okay. So there was never a feeling of abandonment. Okay. Or so so the, really the first part of the story starts when you leave Missouri and go to Illinois. So I'm gonna let you to bring that to life for us. I'm just gonna get out of the way here, okay? Okay, thank you. After Peter went to join the Union Army in Missouri, word came to me that he had died in a hospital in St. Louis. And then I wondered, Lord, what am I going to do? I've got three children to raise, enslaved, and it's breaking my heart to see them out in the fields in the hot sun in Missouri every day. So I decided there was only one thing I could do, escape across to Illinois where Peter had told me about the Underground Railroad system there. And I made up my mind. I packed up my three children, two boys pulling at my skirt tails, and my baby Ann, eight months old, in my arm. And I knew the dangers of trying to escape because I was afraid that if nothing else, my baby would cry out and they would discover us. But I had to try because I know that's what Peter would want me to do. So we escaped and we made our way to Hannibal. We traveled by night in the, in the, the dark and we got a little help from the moonlight. During the day, the slaves in the fields would help us. They would give us food and water and hide us while we rest. We made it to Hannibal. And as soon as we got to Hannibal, a bunch of Confederate soldiers caught us. And they were about to put us in chains. And another faction of federal soldiers came and said that we were with them. And they gave us to these soldiers and they put us on an old raggedy rowboat down at the Mississippi River. Now I'd never rowed on a rowboat before, but I didn't care. I started rowing, that boat was going this way, and it was going that way, and this way, and that way. We were headed to freedom. And we got a little ways out into the river, and the Confederate soldiers saw us. And they started yelling at us. Hey, you, they start calling us names. And then all of a sudden, pow, 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 they start shooting a gun at me and my babies, and it scared us to death. My babies were crying, and I was crying. I got them quieted down and I prayed that God wouldn't let them shoot us. And then 
was really quiet out in that river. Wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. And early in the morning, I could see the shores of Mississippi. And we got closer. There were men on the banks, and my, my heart went to my feet. I thought, oh, God, not the bounties. Don't let them get us after all we've been through to get here. As we got closer, they were German fishermen. And they recognized us as runaways. And they took us off of that old, beautiful, dilapidated rowboat. They gave us food and water and a place to rest. And they showed us how to get to Quincy so that we could work in the, get with the Underground Railroad system to our freedom. Father Roy Bauer, you not only have you had a long career as a priest, but you grew up in Quincy. So sort of like Father Tolton, you went to Quincy schools and, and, and all that. And, and as a result of that, you're very familiar with he, Father Tolton, aren't yes, you? Yes, I have been all my life. He had a kind of a tough go, didn't he? Yes, indeed. Um, and his, uh, by, by the time he got to Quincy, then of course there was a problem about his education at St. Boniface School. Uh, where he was rejected by the other students and by the parents mm -hmm. of the other students. And so uh, he had to leave that school. And that was when uh, Father Peter McGear at um, St. Uh, Lawrence, the church was called at that time, it's now St. Peter's, uh, accepted him in St. Peter's School. And so he got a lot of his basic education then at uh, uh, St. Peter's School. And he, he also worked. He was only able to go to school uh, when he was not employed. Uh, he worked in a, uh, a tobacco factory down at Fifth and, uh, and Payson Avenue. Mm -hmm. And uh, then in the wintertime when that was closed is when he uh, uh, went, to, went to school at St. Peter's. Mm -hmm. is, is it your sense that he always wanted to be a priest? Well, yeah, well I kind of think so. You know, because it, he served Mass every day, uh, and, you know, eventually, I, I don't know whether Father McGear brought it up or whether he brought it up to Father McGear about um, studying to be a, be a priest, but then he's got more education, you know, at um, um, St. Francis College at Quincy University, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, he, he must have uh, been aware that there were no black priests in the United States? Yes, I'm sure he was. Um, there were three priests before him who were partially black, but they were not recognizable as black. Uh, they were from Georgia. Their dad was an Irishman. Uh, the mom was a very light-skinned slave. And um, so his, the, the children were technically slaves, but, the, but the, the, uh, they were not recognized as blacks. And mm -hmm. then the dad w sent them up north for, these are the Healy brothers, they talk about the Healy brothers, and uh, sent them up north so they would not, you know, people would identify them as black and mm -hmm. as, as slaves. And one of the Healy's became, uh, eventually became the uh, bishop in the state of Maine. Uh, one became the pastor of Holy Cross Cathedral in Boston, and the other became the rector of uh, a Catholic University wow. in uh, D.C. Pretty successful people. Yes. Uh huh. Oh uh, wow. And in D.C., it's so interesting that they, at the time, they did not admit black students, but the rector of the mm -hmm. of the school actually, you know, was mm -hmm. uh, partially black. Mm -hmm. But I don't know whether uh, August Tolton was aware of them, you yeah. know, that, uh, uh, but, yeah. so. But, but he must have known, just given his experiences, that he was kind of fighting an uphill battle, wasn't yes. he? Yes, uh-huh. He, he ran into roadblocks all the, all the way through, even in just trying to get an education and then uh, clear on, uh, it, without Father McGurr, I guess, it, it would not have been possible. That's probably true, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he, you mentioned that he had certain qualities which make him saintly. 
and and I and I think I think one of them said you say he was a long suffering <laughs> yeah. individual. Describe that. To yeah. Mark. Okay. In uh, in the old catechisms of the Catholic Church, they talked about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That if a person uh, has has the Holy Spirit, what the fruit of the gifts of the Spirit are, what a person's life is like. And one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit was called long suffering. Now, nowadays in the catechism, they don't use that expression. They just use the word patience. Mm -hmm. Well, the word patience, you know, people use that word all the time. You know, they say, I got impatient waiting for the traffic light to change. Mm -hmm. But uh, I really like that expression, long suffering, because it means that a person will, if you know you're doing what is right, uh, you, that you're, you're going to follow through no matter what the uh, trials or tribulations mm -hmm. are going to be. And I think that would be the outstanding. Uh, uh, somebody asked me, they said, you know, you Catholics pray to St. Anthony to find things and you pray to different saints. What about Father Tolan? Well, is there something special? Yeah, pray to him for the, for the gift of long suffering, you know, that you can put up with uh, distressful things as long as you know you're doing what's right just continue mm -hmm. to do what is right mm -hmm. so and you know it's kind of ironic too because you take this man who was capable of putting up with so much and then to die at such an early age you know he would have gladly suffered many many more oh, years wouldn't yes. he? I mean uh -huh. it was a very 43 years old yeah mm -hmm. pitiful Joanne Fry we've heard the name Father McGurr numerous times when we're talking about Father Tolton Turns out, he was a relative of yours, and right. tell me if I'm right, right, great, great, great uncle. Correct. Okay, and, and everybody in the, in the family knew his story and his relationship with Father Tolton. Mm -hmm. he, Father Tolton probably would never have, maybe never gotten an education, and certainly would not have become a priest without no. Father McGurr. How, how did all that happen? Well, the, it was the custom for the um, owners of the slaves to uh, educate the family in their religion, the owner's religion. Mm -hmm. So they were Catholic. And when they did come uh, fleeing from Brush Creek, Missouri, they came and were in Quincy and the mother found work at a tobacco factory and she placed um, Augustus in the school at St. Boniface. Mm -hmm. But the white mothers complained. Mm -hmm. And so the priest hated to tell her, but he, he felt that he w must because maybe the other people would take the children out of school. Oh, yeah. So she put him in the colored school. He was about 14. He was big and he had not learned to read. He hadn't been in school mm. long, long enough to read. And so then he um, was made fun of by the older kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also called him names because his father wasn't around. His father had joined the Union Army and mm -hmm. gone to St. Louis. Uh, they probably didn't know that the father died of, of uh, infection while he was in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And uh, with all that happening, it was no wonder he didn't want to be in school. Mm -hmm. And so Father McGurr saw him on the street and said, Gus, why aren't you in school? <laughs> and he heard the story. He said, you come to my school. And Father McGurr's housekeeper was also his niece. And he said, if anybody comes from the church and wants to discuss this matter, tell them that I will speak to them at mass. In other words, they would get a story, a, a sermon about mm -hmm. being tolerant. Mm -hmm. He he saw something special in Father Tolton. Yes. And and Father Tolton, I assume, wanted to become a priest because he respected Father McGurr so much. Um, after time went on, mm -hmm. uh, and then Father McGurr saw that he not, had tutoring by the brothers that were almost next door mm -hmm. because Quincy College started. Uh, across the street. Yeah. Father Zimmerman, way back in, uh, uh, well, you told me the year, uh, maybe 1997, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. you helped put together 
a 100th anniversary uh, for, for the death and, and, and right. a commemoration for the death of Father Tolt and you and Father Bauer did that. And I'm sure that was Father Bauer's, it was largely his initiative because he was pastor at St. Peter's. He commissioned a statue of Father Tolton at St. Peter's, which is there on the grounds, you know, up against the school. Mm -hmm. And he renamed the old convent there, Tolton Hall. And you can see that big sign there when you go to St. Peter's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and, and so you had people really from all over, all over the country. Yes, we tried here. to get people, especially over the Midwest, but we had, we had Archbishop Regali from St. Louis, and I believe there were like 15 bishops you know, that came from mm -hmm. all over. And so, uh, you yeah, know, we had. Yeah. So you became sort of a de, a de facto go-to guy when it came mm -hmm. to Tolton. You yeah. and Father Bauer, did. the two of us, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and he it, he know he knows more about it. You know, well, like he, I think he told you that he used to had some contact with the church before it was torn down, mm -hmm. where Father uh, Tolton, you know, yeah. ministered. And so yeah. now recently, uh, Rome has become aware of Father Tolton's gifts and is considering him for statehood, and in fact, you and Father Bauer were For sainthood. I, I'm sorry, for sainthood, <laughs> God, I'm doing a different story. Yeah, yeah. Um, you uh -huh. and Father Bauer were invited to Chicago mm -hmm. for sort of a fact-finding. Uh, it, it, it was a kind of a liturgical, uh, it took place in this chapel, a beautiful little chapel, which is a copy of the Saint-Chapelle in Paris, and it's a magnificent little church, and the place was packed, I mean, uh, and then they had uh, you know, they had prayers and readings and all that. Mm -hmm. And then I remember at one part of the ceremony, they they named certain people who were going to be in charge of keeping the the evidence for this uh, mm -hmm. for this canonization. And then they had to take an oath and sign papers and all that. And that was mm -hmm. all part of the ceremony. Yeah. And and this canonization can can take a long time. Yes, it, it can. It's, it's mm -hmm. a very a strict. They follow very strict proceedings, mm -hmm. don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the things they have to do is 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 prove that or beyond, at least to satisfy them, that, that Father Tolton was involved in a couple of miracles. Yes. Mm -hmm. And is there any evidence of such a thing? As I say, I heard a story of one, and I don't know the details of it, so mm -hmm. I really don't think I should talk about it, but that's all I know right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when, he was, when he was in Quincy, um, b trying to get an education, mm -hmm. it was a very difficult thing for him to do because blacks at the time, it was not a ready thing, was it? It was something right. that somebody had to really get behind and, and, and mm -hmm. help him along. What See, slavery, like? slavery really discouraged any kind of educating of slaves. That was dangerous even to learn to read. And so, uh, and I think that, that attitude rubbed off, you know, even though slavery was gone for 15 years by the time he went to the seminary way, it still, those attitudes linger, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. And how did he finally get to the seminary? Well, uh, Father McGurr at St. Peter's worked with him, and uh, uh, let's see. See, there were some Franciscans at St. Francis College, which is now Quincy University, who, uh, who stepped in and kind of tutored him. Mm -hmm. There was another priest, I think, at St. Boniface who tutored him too, and maybe even two of them, uh, as I recall, that uh, gave him private lessons of various mm -hmm. kinds. And they, they taught him, you know, taught him, I guess, languages and uh, religion and things like that. And uh, the most important person in, my, in the story that I tell is Father Michael Rickard, who was a Franciscan at, at St. Francis College, uh, who was involved in helping him. He, I think Father Michael had also uh, begun some kind of a catechism program down at the St. Joseph's Church. This was before Father Tilton was ever ordained. Mm -hmm. He was ministering to black Catholics in Quincy. And he had, he had uh, Augustus Tilton working at this church giving lessons to the children there, see, and uh, so when it came time for him to go for a seminary, they, they kept writing to seminaries all over the country and nobody would accept him. Uh, I think part of it was that there were laws in many states that said that a black and a white cannot stay overnight in the same place, mm. you know, and mm -hmm. they didn't want to get in trouble for, for that yeah. kind of thing. And then uh, I just recently uh, read an account that said, like in Teutopolis, Illinois, the <clears throat> Germans there were facing enough um, enough uh, prejudice on because they were German that they didn't want to handle another prejudice dealing mm -hmm. with race issues. So they, they didn't want to have him. Father Michael uh, wrote to Rome and it turned out, uh, originally I think Father McGurr and even the bishop I think had written to Rome asking to get him into this seminary in Rome called the Propaganda. It, that's a Latin word that means uh, basically spreading of the faith. Mm -hmm. you know. And um, they, they wouldn't accept him but Father Michael uh, knew the Franciscan 
head of the Franciscan order in Rome, and he knew the cardinal in charge of this seminary. And through that sort of, uh, who, you know, who knows who you know mm -hmm, connections, mm -hmm. uh, they got him admitted to the uh, seminary in Rome. And so that's how he got there and mm -hmm. uh, then went on to finish his studies and be ordained. Peggy Frankenhoff, you know, since Father Tolton has become so famous recently and because they're thinking about him for sainthood, anything that he signed or touched or had anything to do with has become very significant. And it turns out that you became aware, you and your husband became, it came in possession of this some time ago. Yeah. And for those who don't know what it is, it's, it's a certificate of first communion um, and it's certified that Father Tolton presided at this, at this ceremony. Well, how, did you, how did you come to own it? I believe it's a baptismal. Baptismal? Says, baptismal, yes. Okay. Uh, bought it at an auction. Mm -hmm. And I think the auction was uh, of a colored family. And uh, they had it there and he recognized who it was. And Your husband did? Yes. Yeah. And uh, someone else had bought it. and. He uh, wanted me to ask him if they would sell it. Mm -hmm. They did. Yeah, and and it, you know it's really beautiful. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. So not only do you have something that's historically significant, but you got something that's pretty as well. Lots of color. Yeah, lots of color. So you're not going to part with it, are you? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> it's really neat. Not today. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> when Gus was ordained in Rome, he was sent back to Illinois. He came back to Quincy. And he did his first high mass at St. Boniface Church. People came from all around to hear him. And when he was done with his high mass, they assigned him to minister to the colored people at St. Joseph Church in Quincy. And every Sunday, that church was filled with black and white Catholics because they wanted to hear Gus. He was a great speaker, and they could feel God coming through him. He loved the Lord, and he never failed to let everyone know that. There was a priest named Father Weiss, and he was angry with Gus because all of the parishioners came from other churches to his church. Every Sunday they would come to hear him and left hardly no one at the white church. So he told Father Tolton that he should turn down all the white people that came to his church because that, though he was supposed to, to preach just to the colors. Well, Gus couldn't go for that. That wasn't who he was. And rather than cause a lot of trouble and, and hard feelings, he chose to find a place to go. And he tried different areas. He wanted to go to Boston, but nobody had a spot for him. And finally, they accepted him in Chicago because there was a need to minister to the colored Catholics in Chicago. So he moved to Chicago and um, went to St. Monica's Church. And at the time, they didn't have a building. They actually had their services at St. Mary's Church in the basement. He worked very, very hard to minister to those people because they were poor and he, they were hungry and he saved all of the souls. He did fundraisers and finally, they were able to build their own church, St. Monica's in Chicago. And that's where he worked tirelessly. He didn't think of himself. He always thought of others and he, he denied himself and he worked so hard, he didn't think about his health and he did speeches and talks and traveling, and all the money that he raised came back to the church. At the age of 43 years old, which is so young, he fell dead from a heat stroke. He had just come from a retreat, and in the hot sun in Chicago, at the age of 43, he fell dead. Well, Iris Nelson, you're the research librarian at the Quincy Library, and much of what we know about Father Tolton is actually written in a biography from some years ago by a sister, a Catholic nun, who was mm -hmm. sort of going through the Tolton experience. 
she was teaching black children in Chicago. Yes, that's right. And she was teaching, it was her first year of teaching in 1933. She was teaching to black children in Chicago. She learned of St. Monica's, which was gone at that time. But she learned of St. Monica's and Father Tolton mm -hmm. while she was in her first year of teaching. And that basically set off her curiosity to continue the research for 40 years. Wow. This book was published in 1973. So for many of her years, she was interviewing, for example, Tolton's parishioners. Mm -hmm. She was interviewing his mother and his sister. And there was um, a sister, Drexel, who helped him financially at different times. Mm -hmm. So she got these first-person accounts of what we have a very precious book in this, in the sense that without her doing that footwork, we wouldn't know the full story mm -hmm. of Father Tolton. Yeah, and in fact, somebody like Matt Morris, who has put another more time into this, yes. was inspired and instructed by much of what's in this book. Exactly. Yeah. She would not know how she came across the river in a rowboat, how tough it was with the guns firing at mm -hmm. the boat, and the children being scared and then having to be quieted, and the fears she would have had just going across the river for the first time in mm -hmm. a rowboat. Mm -hmm. So all of that comes to us for the, you know, to add the richness to Father Tolton's story. Right, right. Um, so she did the research. She has a lot of documents. She traveled many places. She worked very hard for many years to uh, get the story published. So we owe her a debt in that sense. I'm sure it was a great labor of love. Um, but to work on something for 40 years in your spare time, I'm sure, wow. um, is, is certainly addition to mm -hmm. Father Tolton's story. And, and we should note, while I have you here in front of this painting, this painting hang, hung in the old St. Boniface Church yes. where Father Tolton would have seen it and he would have been aware of it uh, on a daily basis. So. Exactly. Excellent. So it's very significant yeah. that we're here today shooting mm -hmm. and we can have this as a backdrop yeah. for the story. If Father Tolton is canonized and becomes St. Augustine Tolton, it is said that the present St. Boniface Church, which is closed, could become a shrine. And Catholics from all over the world would come to learn about and pray to St. Augustine Tolton. With another Illinois story in Quincy, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.